Which on Rosh Hashanah, Rosh, or you, there's different pronunciations, Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah, so whatever your preference is, depends on if you're from the north or the south, I think, on the accent. I'm kidding. And uh, I'm going to preach on Rosh Hashanah and also uh, Abraham's prophetic end time pattern. If you have a Bible, John chapter 8, verse 56 through 59. John chapter 8, verse 56 through 59. And here's what the scripture says. Jesus is speaking here. Listen to this verse. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it. Stop. How could Abraham who lived long before Christ, never met him, rejoiced to see his day. Jesus said he did. Abraham was a prophet. Maybe I'll explain that in a moment. Then the Jews said unto him, Are there not, 50, uh, not yet 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Verily, 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 actually means truly, truly, or I say honestly. We would say that honestly, I'm telling you the truth. Verily, verily, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, when they heard I am, if they heard it in Greek, it's one way. If they heard it in Hebrew, it's another way. But you remember, God said, I am that I am. And that's what upset them. Listen to me carefully. Not because he said he was before Abraham, but when Jesus said, I am, then they took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus went his way. When he said, I am, in Hebrew, in the book of Exodus, I think it's around chapter 6, God said to, or chapter 3, God said to Moses, I am that I am. And I am that I am means I am what I am, I was what I was, and I will be what I will be. That's actually what it re refers to. It means past, present, future. But when he said, I am, they were saying he was equating himself to be like God or equal to God. And that's why they attempted to stone him. But I want to key up on the verse, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and saw it. Now, Rosh Hashanah, as you know, as most of you know, has been uh, uh, something which was introduced a long time ago in the Word of God as the Festival of Trumpets. It is also called uh, Yom, uh, Yom Terah, and it happens during the month of Tishrei. We happen to be in the month of Tishrei on the Jewish calendar, and it's the seventh month on the what we call the calendar that the Jews keep today. The first month is Nisan, and the first month usually falls in March or April. It's different every year, and you have three, three spring festivals of Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits that occur during that festival. On Tishrei, you also have three festivals that occur. So there's three in the spring, three in the fall. You have what is called trumpets, which is also called Rosh Hashanah, and I'll tell you what it means in a moment. And then ten days later, you come to the Day of Atonement. Five days later, you come to the Festival of Tabernacles, which lasts for an entire week. The first three festivals of Passover and and, uh, and I'm sorry, of, Pente of Pentecost and of, of first fruits. And, you know, I got a little brain fog. My brain's a little slower than it used to be. Uh, and first fruits and unleavened bread are the uh, first appearing of, appearing of Jesus for his crucifixion and his resurrection and for the disciples seeing him alive as the first fruits of the dead. That's his fulfillment as the lamb. He's coming back as the lion. The lion symbols are trumpets. Then Day of Atonement, which is a picture of the great tribulation which is coming. And then Tabernacles is the time of the kingdom where God, Jesus Christ will set up the kingdom on the earth. Having said that, if you look at this time called Rosh Hashanah, it is the Jewish New Year. It is the time of the Festival of Trumpets. And it's, this, this is found in Leviticus 23, verse 24 and, and 25, and also Numbers 29 and verse 1. Now, the reason that people get keyed up so much on this festival Festival. And I want you to track with me because I'm going to go on a rabbit trail right here is because if you want to know time wise where we are as far as the festivals are concerned, we are in what's called the church age or the dispensation of the grace of God, which is connected to Pentecost and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what's working in the church to get the gospel out and to win sinners to the Lord. You were convicted by the Holy Spirit when you came to know Jesus. You are baptized with the Holy Spirit to receive power from on high. The Holy Spirit brings the anointing that breaks the yoke and brings the anointing that delivers people from the powers of the enemy. So therefore, the, we are living in an extended period of what I call 
Pentecost. Don't think of a denomination. Just think of a movement of his spirit in the earth. So we are now in the dispensation of God's grace. What does dispensation mean? It's the Greek word ekonomia, and it means the dispensing of something. It actually means a steward given responsibility to dispense information or something significant legally to other people in the community. So we are in a dispensation. What does that mean? That we have been given the responsibility by God to preach the gospel of the kingdom, which is what John the Baptist talked about, the kingdom of God, and Jesus talked about it, and it's throughout the New Testament. Do you realize in the four gospels, the word church is only mentioned a limited amount of time, but the word kingdom is mentioned over and over and over and over and over again in those four gospels. Now, when you consider what I'm about to say, so track with me here, that as we are living here in Pentecost, the next feast to be fulfilled is trumpets. Now, this is why if you watch the internet, you got to be careful what you're watching, who you're watching, when you watch. But if you've ever watched YouTube, you will discover that there were so many people saying, this is the year, this is the year. When everybody starts saying it's the year, I know it's not the year because Jesus said in the day and hour that you think not, I'm coming back. That's why when 88 Reasons came, God bless Bill Cloud, got saved reading 88 Reasons. That's the greatest convert the man had writing that book. But I want to tell you, outside of Bill Cloud getting saved, the reason I said he wasn't coming in 88, I said everybody's looking for him in 88. Because when Jesus said, you don't know the day and you don't know the hour, and in a day and an hour you think not, you have to be careful. Because what will happen is everybody will put the coming off of the Lord off till next year, when in reality, the rapture could happen on a feast or it could happen outside of a feast. I'm talking about the rapture, not the second coming. It will definitely happen on a festival and probably the rapture will as well. But when the day of trumpets is gone, then people look to something else. Now the reason I want to talk about this is because trumpets is the next festival to be fulfilled in the fe listing of the festivals and there's a hundred trumpet blasts that are sounded on that day. Guess what the last one is called? The 100th blast is called the last trump. And the Bible said, at the sound of the last trump, we shall be, come on, somebody. And it's also the loudest and the longest, which parallels with Exodus 19. Okay, I don't want to get on that too much because that's too long of, of a message to get into. Now, when Jesus said this, watch carefully. No man knows the day of the hour of my return. No man knows, but he did say, look for the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Now, when you think about this, the festival of Rosh Hashanah, or what we would call it trumpets, is interesting because you don't know the day or the hour it begins. Do you know why? Because there is no moon in the sky, and the ending of that ends the month of Elul, and then you come to the month of Tishrei. You do not know when the month of Tishrei begins until you see the silver sliver of the moon, and it's anywhere between 24 to 48 hours when you determine when the month actually began. And so the Feast of Trumpets, if you ever look at it on a calendar, it will always give you two days for it to begin. It begins on this day and also begins on that day, but the reason they do that is they're not sure which time... Get me now what the day or the hour is, listen to me, until they see a sign in the heaven of the silver moon, the sliver of the moon, and then the witnesses go and announce in the old days that the festival had begun, the season had come, the new month had began. And even the word month in Hebrew is connected to the word moon, the Hebrew word for moon. It's all connected together. Are you still here? Say amen. But see, there has to be a cosmic sign. Jesus said, look for the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Lord God, don't get me preaching on that one. Please don't. I'm working on something for the, for the prophetic summit that's absolutely mind-boggling, mind-blowing, so I'm going to shut up right here. Somebody say, help him shut up, Jesus. I don't want to get off on that message. I really do not. Now, here, here's the thing. The Jewish New Year, 5784, has begun, and uh, we are now in the season of the Jewish New Year. We are now in what is called the Days of Awe. We are in the uh, we're coming through. The, we're still in the Days of Awe, but we're coming into the 10 days when it's believe that the window of heaven is open for prayers to be received, for God to make those decisions which will be sealed in a few days on what is called the Day of Atonement. I do believe without a doubt there is truth in that particular tradition. You've heard me talk about that over the years. So I want to talk about the prophetic patterns of Abraham for just a moment. The first thing I want to tell you is that it is believed by Jews, and this is interesting because if you were in a Jewish synagogue and you were there during Rosh Hashanah in Israel when this celebration started, they would have 
we've read two particular scriptures or verses from what we call the Torah, the Old Testament. And one of them was the birth of Isaac. The birth of Isaac is read on Rosh Hashanah. The other, believe this or not, is the, the binding of Isaac on Mount Moriah, where, he, where God said to offer him and God picked him up off the altar. The Jewish rabbis believe. And there's other, by the way, there's other things all through the Bible that are believed to have happened according to the tradition of the rabbinical, uh, the rabbis that were supposed to happen on Rosh Hashanah. But what is interesting here is Isaac and Abraham are mentioned in two, these two important stories on the Jewish New Year. The story of the birth of Isaac, and this is important, and the story of Abraham putting Isaac on the altar there on top of Mount Moriah. Now when you look at what uh, the story of Abraham being on top of Mount Moriah, something is missed that is almost never preached on by preachers. They tell you that there was a ram caught in the thicket and he took that ram and offered him in place of Isaac. But what they don't tell you is what did they do to that ram to get him out of the thicket? A man, listen, a man that is 137 years old, Abraham may have been that old when he offered, uh, when he offered Isaac. Isaac was not a teenage boy. I want to challenge you on that to prove to me he was a teenage boy. He was not a teenage boy. He was in his 30s. And I don't want to even talk about that because, oh, that, no, that'll get, that'll get me sidetracked in a whole other area, and I will get emails on that. But the, the fact that his mother was old when she gave him birth, there were a lot of traditions as to why he was a mommy's boy, that he had some uh, uh, biological challenges. Do you understand with reading between the lines that as a young boy, he didn't get married till he was about 40? Who who waits for their boy to be married when they're 40. He was a mama's boy. He was with mama in the tent. When he finally got married, he takes his wife into his mother's tent and is comforted because of his mother's death. She did not want that. She wanted that boy around her forever. Come on. And the Bible tells you Sarah died and Sarah had to die in order for Isaac to get married or he'd have been a mama's boy the rest of his life and would have never married and there'd never been a nation of Israel. That's the deepest part of the message so far, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's the deepest part of the message so far. But let me go back to the ram. Do you realize that when an old man, an old man and a young guy are trying to get a ram on an altar, do you know what difficulty that could be with a ram? This is not a sheep. This is not a goat. They are, the, you get them stirred and they have pictures of rams pushing people to the ground and they take their horns and crush, am I telling the truth? And they crush their, their lungs. You know, what, you know what God did? God let the ram's horns get caught in a thicket, a bush, because God took the fight out of the blessing. I'm gonna say it again. God took the fight out of the blessing. He paralyzed that ram in one location by the horns being caught and the ram's doing this. And Abraham said, Isaac, you get on one end, I got on the other. We got this thing, boy. God, every now and then you might want to pray to God that all this mess that you're dealing with, that you'll say, God, would you please give me a time when you take the fight out of the blessing? When I don't feel like I'm always struggling over my money or I'm not always struggling over my situation. Every now and then you need God to send you a ram on a mountain that gets caught in a thicket. Come on, that'll take the fight out of your blessing. <laughs> Woo. But the two horns are interesting because they took those two horns and held on to them. Those horns weren't just thrown away. Horns were very valuable. And the tradition of the Jews, now you got to remember when I say tradition, some of this goes back thousands of years. This is not just somebody that said, hey, that's a cool story. That one of those horns was used by Moses and Joshua. One is allegedly taken to heaven and will be used when the trump of God sounds and the dead are raised. <laughs> so this, what I'm saying is you read these stories and there is so much interesting fact and truth and even tradition that's based in this stuff that it just blows your mind. Now, when, how do we know Abraham was prophetic? Because God says the prophet Abraham and calls him a prophet. The scripture makes it clear in the Old Testament, actually, that he was a prophet. So here, let me just, let me stop right here. 
If you've never heard me teach this, I'm going to try to go back to, to memory lane. In Genesis 22, Abraham, the father, takes his son Isaac to Mount Moriah. Now, you know that's in Jerusalem. That's in the area where Christ would be crucified. Hello. Okay, you with me? And then he takes the wood and lays it on him. And they get on top of the mountain. And here's what it says. As they're going on a three-day journey, talk to me. There's three days in the story. Jesus was in the heart of the earth three days. There it is. It says, and Abraham saw the place afar off. And there's two Hebrew words there. Abraham saw hamakom, hamakom, merachuk. Now, don't let those words hang you up, but Bill Cloud and I did a study on this years ago. And when it says he saw the place, the word the place, the Hebrew word there, can also be, by rabbinical sources, another name for God. Get ready. Then he saw it afar off. Afar off can mean peering in the distance, but the actual Hebrew word, you ready for this, can mean to see something in the future. So if we retranslate it to the Stone's Unauthorized Version, and you could do this from the Hebrew, it could read this way. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw something about God's God in the future. See, he looked and saw a vision. I'm going to prove it to you. Because when they got there, Isaac said, where is the lamb? Oh, where's the, where's the animal? They were, he was asking for the animal. And Abraham says, God shall provide himself a lamb. And he wasn't talking about that moment because five minutes later, a lamb never showed up on that mountain. A ram showed up and there's a difference between a ram and a lamb. And then it says later in verse 14 of Genesis 22, and he called the name of the place. What did I tell you? The place. He saw the place can be another name of God in Hebrew. You got Hamakom, the place. But he saw the place afar off. And then it said he called the name of the place Yahweh Yaira. Or in English, translation with using the J letter instead of the Y, Jehovah Jaira. And listen to what Moses wrote. As it is said to this day, in the mountain of the Lord, it shall be seen. Abraham saw more than just a, a rock altar. He saw more than wood and he saw much more than his, his boy getting laid down and bound up and tied up. When Abraham peered out in the spirit, he saw a vision of a lamb on that altar, but it wasn't a four-legged lamb covered with wool. It was a two-legged man that would be the lamb of God that was going to take away the sins of the world. And that's how the Bible says Abraham rejoiced when he saw my day end he saw it Abraham left the land of Ur which is the territory of ancient Babel don't forget I just said that ancient Babel and he came to the promised land through Isaac would come the nation of Israel he had 318 servants that actually rode camels and defeated five kings that had invaded the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and took all the stuff and the people back to the cities. He gave tithe to a man by the name of Melchizedek. That's a title. Melik is king, Melik. Zadok is righteousness. It means the king of righteousness. Uh, some believe it was Jesus of, from the Old Testament, but you can't say that because there's too many errors in that particular teaching. The Jewish people teach it was Shem, the righteous son of Noah. And that's very possible because Shem's uh, descendants settled in that area. And Shem would have still, this is crazy, but Shem would have still been living after the flood in the time of Abraham. Hello. First king and priest of the Most High God, a picture of the ministry of Jesus, Melchizedek. He offers Isaac in Genesis 22 on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. He sees the place afar off. But here's the big key. Ready? The big key is Lot. 
Because in the beginning of the story of Genesis chapter 12, when God tells Abraham to leave his kindred and family behind, he takes his father, Terah, and his nephew, Lot, with him to Haran, which is in Syria. And he spends two years there, long enough for a famine to hit the promised land. So he gets to the promised land, finds out there's a famine there, and goes all the way down to Egypt, and that's where he hooks up with Hagar. Come on, somebody. Better watch the famines in the land. When a famine hits a church, people bail out. You better not bail out because famines are only temporary. Blessings are permanent. <laughs> famines are temporary. Prophetic words are permanent when God speaks them. So don't bail out on the word. Hey, I'm going to preach her anyhow. Now here's what happens. The reason Lot is so significant is this one verse in Matthew. Actually, it's recorded in Luke and Matthew as it was in the days of so will it be at the time of the coming of the Son of Man. Then Luke says, as it was in the days of Lot. So will it be at the, timing of, the time of the coming of the Son of Man. So the reason Lot is so significant is he is linked with Abraham. And there had to be a separation of Lot from Abraham before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah occurred, they were already separated. Now they were still family, but Lot was living in one area and Abraham was in Beersheba. Beersheba is, a, uh, is an area where there are seven wells that Abraham dug. It's a, it's a place that exists to this day. Several, several ministers uh, sent me something and said, oh my goodness, have you seen this? And, they didn't know I had published that 25 years ago. <laughs> I hear people say, Perry, have you ever heard about the ashes of the red heifer? My God, there's a red heifer burning in Israel, and they got to have it for the rebuilding of the temple. I said, yeah, I think the cassette tape that is on is the fall of Tennessee 1986, but we don't know where it is. It's because I preached on the red heifer when nobody preached on the red heifer. They thought I was a nut. Now it's in Time Magazine and the Jewish rabbi. So, you know, hang with Perry Stone. He is not as stupid as some people think he is. Come on, somebody. I, come on, I'll, I'll, I may preach on edge and I may give you some things that sound a little bit strange at the time. Just hang with me, though. You'll see it. You'll see it. It'll start happening. <laughs> I just felt a little jerk in it. Can you mind if I jerk my back a little bit and do a little Pentecostal shimmy right now? Praise God. But it's true, isn't that wonderful that the Holy Spirit knows these things when, before? He knows it's not me. He just knows things in advance. Amen. So this is a chart that I published 20-some years ago. I, and if you're watching right now, I know what you're going to say. Perry, what book is in? I do not know. I've printed 100 books. It's in one of them. But we talk, we talk about this. Now, Jonathan is going to bring this up on the screen, I hope. This, oh, this is the amazing... Let's just look at this. In leave, it, leave that up, Jonathan, before we go anywhere else. All right. If you look at this listing, this is a listing that will tell you how old the father was when the first son is born. Okay? Now, remember, Seth is at, uh, Adam to Seth is 130 years. Seth is born outside the Garden of Eden. All right. So these, these years are when that dad had the first son. Adam to Seth is 130 years. And this is in your Bible. There's the reference. Seth to Enos is 105 years. Enos to Canaan is 90 years. G uh, Genesis 5, 12. Canaan to Mahalalel is 70 years. Mahalalel to Jared is 65 years. Jared to Enoch is 162 years. Enoch was 65 when he begat Methuselah. There's the number. Methuselah begat Lamech at 187 years. Lamech was, begot Noah at 182 years of age. Well, they got married late or something. Noah to Shem is 500 years. It says that Noah was 500 years old and Shem, Ham, and Japheth were born. So there's Shem. Shem to Arphaxad is 100 years. And there should be another part to the list, Jonathan, there if you want to bring it. Okay. Arphaxad, you have to put the two years after the flood. It will tell you there's two years after the flood. There's two years. Arphaxad to Salah. Watch this now. Uh, Salah is 35 years. Salah to Eber, 30 years. Eber to Peleg, 34 years. Peleg to Ro'u, 30 years. There's your scripture references there. Uh, Re'ek to Sirah, 32 years. Sirah to Nahor, Nahor, or Nahor, 30 years. Nahor to Terah, 29 years. Terah to Abraham, 70 years. Totaling 1,948 years. I'm going to let that soak in because some of you ain't got 1948 down there yet. I'm going to make an announcement. 
Y'all don't know this yet. Plan it. Bill Cloud and I last year did a pay-per-view. It wasn't pay-per-view with the company. We wouldn't do that. I don't want to fuss, but I don't want to give secular people that. It would go. But we did pay-per-view, and it was a $20 charge because we have eight people working, tech people, setting that thing up. It costs money to do it. And we were able to share things we don't share sometimes on conferences, and I couldn't share it on YouTube, and I couldn't share it on Facebook or, because what you're preaching would be taken down. It would just be taken down. We're getting ready to do one called Prophecy from a Hebrew Perspective. No one's done this. I'm going to do the study of Bible numbers and how, why they work when you use a system called gematria. And it only works with Greek and Hebrew. And Bill and I are talking. It's going to be one of the most mind-blowing two days. It'll be January. It'll be uh, Thursday, Friday in January. So when I announce it, we, I, I, don't know, I don't know how many we can put on, but we go live at that moment. You, you can send your questions in, and the computer lets you vote what question you want us to answer, and it moves it to the top. It is a blast. And Bill has already got some rabbinical prophecies most people have never heard. And it's going to be, okay, so I want to tell you. So th this is why, I, th well, that's fine, Jonathan. Don't bring that back up. It's fine. But this is why I like numbers. Because let me, let, me, let me explain something to you. Every number is there for a reason. If you go to the flood, and I'm not here to preach this, this will probably come out in that January teaching. Do you know how many numbers are used in the flood story? 120, 40 days, 150 days, one year, one month, one day, seven days. Do you realize every one of those numbers is a cryptic reference to what would happen on a certain time frame? Before the rapture. Oh, yeah. Drop the mic. <laughs> Who wants to hear that teaching? Yeah. It, it'll come. Now, why is, one, why is 1948 important? Because if we go to the time of Jesus, and you know there's B.C., really, they drive me crazy because when I do archaeology or I, I do Bible relics, they want me to say B.C.E., you know, which is before the common era. And then they, they want you to use that common era and then common era. And my, our people don't know what that means. It's BCAD. Amen. And it basically means before Christ and after Christ. Of course, AD doesn't mean after Christ because there's a D there. <laughs> but it has, it's a Latin. And it, I'm, we, but what I'm saying is when I say it, you'll know what I'm talking about. That's why we're going to go that way. If you start at the zero year, now what's the zero year? Zero is... Right at the time Christ is born, the calendar changed. And it became 1 AD, 2 AD, or it was 1 BC, 2 BC. How many know what I'm talking about before I go on, right? We're, you're familiar with that. All right, if we start at the zero year and go 1,948 years forward on our calendar, it comes to the year Israel was restored as a nation again. 1948 to the year. And when you think about it, if the, the, the chart I showed you starts with Adam, right? Then it goes all the way down to Abraham. And it gives you those years. Adam to Abraham, right? It was Adam begat Seth. Seth begat, okay. Now, if I start with the second Adam, who is Jesus, he's called the second man Adam, and go forward... It comes to the time when the nation of Israel, the seed of Abraham, Abraham is restored as a nation. And it's exactly on our calendar, 1,948. Somebody tell me the Bible's not great. Put your hands together and thank God for the word. But that's not the message. You ought to know me by now. I throw, the, I throw the nuggets out there. Then we get to the dessert. There is something very strange. And I'll tell you what happened to me. And I knew this was in the Bible. And I hadn't even thought about it. But Steve Muncy called me. Pastor Steve Muncy. And Pastor Steve Muncy has been here before. And he's just, he's got one of the greatest churches in the country. I preached up there in May, and this is the God's truth. God gave me one of the, I'm going to preach a lot of that message I preached up there at this camp meeting coming up one night. And it was one of the, it's one of the most interesting revelations the Lord's ever given me. 
And during the entire message, his church was on their feet. It's a black church. And I'm telling you, they like to preach me sideways. <laughs> I literally about just laid on my back and just, I tell you the name. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's the easiest church. Him and Jensen's church are the two easiest churches to preach in in the United States. Anyway, and we'll put you at number three. <laughs> so you're in the top three, maybe. But I die, we do enjoy coming here preaching to you. We do. Now, so here's the thing. Um, oh. He asked me a question, and I, I hadn't thought of it. I knew the verse. I knew it was there. I put it together, and then I saw something. And tonight, in the next few minutes, I'm going to share with you what I saw and what I believe it means. And I don't just throw this out there because those of you who've kept up with me over the years and those of you that's really followed our ministry a long time, you know God uses me in a gift of prophecy. Not prophesying over people. That can happen. But the prophetic word of showing you something and say, start looking for this, and it happens. It's a gift. And I give him glory. It has nothing to do with who I am, but I did ask him for wisdom as a young man, and this is the wisdom of the Lord. It's nothing else but wisdom from the Lord. Genesis 12, 1 through 4. Jonathan, I'm not sure if you've got that verse, but if you do, okay, let me, let me make sure we're going the right way. Now the Lord said to Abram, this is Abraham, this was his former name. You see that word Abram? Leave that up right there, Jonathan. You see that word Abram, the name? Did you ever notice that it changes later to Abraham? Abraham, Abraham, Abraham. Do you know what letter was added to that name to change it? It was the, a letter that's in God's name. God's sacred name is Yahweh or Yahweh, some say Yehovah, but it's Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey, and there's two He's. Hey is the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. You can't say it without breathing. Hey, it's a breathing sound. When you add one Hebrew letter in front of it and put a Hey, it spells a Hebrew word that means life, and all the Jews in Israel have a piece of jewelry that has, has chai on it, which is life. And that's what, that, that's what those two letters mean. So hey is breathing sound, hey is life. So God took one letter from his name and put it there, and it became Abraham. Because now when you say Ab Abram, you don't have any bre breath. But when you say Abraham, you have breath, which is life. The letter hey is five, five represents grace, it means life. So God put life in Abraham, and when he did and changed his name, he had a son. <laughs> Tried from 75 to 99 to have a son until God changes his name, puts his, puts, his, puts his breath letter in his name. And by the way, Sarah, Sarah was Sarai, and he put his second hey in her name and made it Sarah. And when both of them got a name changed and got that letter that represents the breath of God in their name, a baby came. Hey! Oh, oh, oh. The Lord said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make you your name great and you shall be a blessing. I'll bless those that... Now, now leave that there. Notice when this promise came, it's very significant what I'm about to tell you by the revelation of the Holy Spirit that you get this part right here. I will bless those that bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Next verse. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Now you say, what does that have to do with anything? Somebody take 1948, write it down, and add 75 to it. Say, say it loud. 20, 23, this year is the year from 1948 that we had 75 years, and this year, starting on the Jewish calendar, represents Abraham's departure from Syria to the Promised Land. Because 75 years has passed since 1948.
948. 1948, Abraham was born. 75 years later, he leaves what he's familiar with and begins walking with God into the promised land. Now stay with me. It is significant that you get this because these are not just random numbers thrown. Why would God want to tell you that he is 75 years of age? Unless, and who's he got with him? Say it out loud. Say it out loud. He's got Lot with him who is the man that the Bible says as it was in the days of Lot, so will it be at the time of the coming of the Son of Man. So Lot's with him. Now, there's two more years in Abraham's life that are going to be significant. And now this is where I'm going to step out a little bit, but I don't, I'm never afraid to step out once I've been quickened by the Spirit of God from a prophetic realm to share something with you. So this, this doesn't scare me to give a particular time frame because I'm not going to tell you what will happen on that time frame. I'm going to give you the time frame. Ecclesiastes 1, 9, and 10 says, The thing which has been is that which shall be, and that which has been done is that which shall be done, and there's nothing new under the sun. Now, what that basically means is history will repeat itself and so will time. Everything will always comes full circle. The Greeks believed that time was circular, cyclical. It came in cycles. It absolutely, listen to me, it absolutely runs in cycles. Uh, let me just give you a, qu a quick example. First two chapters of Genesis and last two chapters of Revelation, they match in the beginning of chapter 1 and 2, there's no sin, no death, no pain, no sorrow, no, there, no devil. The devil don't show up to chapter 3. You go to chapter 21 and 22, Revelation, there's no sin, there's no death, there's no devil, there's no pain, there's no sorrow. In Genesis 1 and 2, man is in an eternal condition until he eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the tree of life which is mentioned in chapter 2, is mentioned in the book of Revelation as being the tree of life and the city of God bearing 12 manner of fruit. And so there is a tree of life in chapter 1 and 2. There's a tree of life in Revelation 21 and 22. There's rivers at the tree of life in Revelation 21 and 22. There's four rivers of Eden running in Genesis chapter 2. What I'm trying to say to you is it ends like it began. The, begin, the end... The beginning is the end, and the end is the beginning. In the ministry of Jesus, there is a Herod. At the end of Jesus' ministry, there's another Herod, and they are related, but it is not the same Herod. There is a Joseph, who's Mary's husband in, at the beginning of Jesus' life. He died somewhere, but there's another Joseph called Joseph of Arimathea. Come on, somebody. I mean... I can tell you that he fasted 40 days at the beginning of his ministry and he was seen alive for 40 days at the end of his ministry. Is anybody tracking with me here? Everything goes in circles. Everything. Okay. The reason these numbers are important is because they connect to Lot and Lot is in the story of, Mo, of Abraham till Genesis 19. So let's look at this. Ready? The second number that becomes important, and I apologize for not giving you the reference here because I just typed this up yesterday, was Hagar. When Abraham is, uh, is offered Hagar, he is 85 years of age. Now, so he was 75, right? So 10 years goes by, he's 85 years of age, and that's the story that comes in with Ishmael, who was the son of Hagar, who was the father of Many of the Arab nations, 12 Arab nations came out of the seed of Ishmael and 12 sons of Jacob came out of the side of Isaac. Track with me now. Then there's another important age mentioned when Abraham is 90 years old and nine, 99 years old in the book of Genesis is when he is circumcised and that is when Isaac is supernaturally born and the official nation of Israel, we think he began with, uh, with uh, you know, uh, Jacob and his sons. 
it really didn't. It began with Abraham and Isaac. There would have been no nation of Israel without the son that God promised to produce the nation, and that was Isaac. All right, if you, if you start in 48, now this is the pivotal year prophetically, and you go from 48, and you go from 48, and you go 75 years, you come to 2023. Mm -hmm. So what's that mean for us? I'm about to tell you. 1948. This is really cool. Now, when I saw this, I'm like, okay, because most of you know I did a two-hour uh, audio CD that said, well, Jesus returned by 2033. If you add the 10 years when Hagar shows up, it adds to 2033. Okay? So something will happen that time frame. And again, I did not tell you that he would come in 2033, but I gave you the reasons why that that would be one of the biggest uh, prophetic years. At 99... He is circumcised. He conceives Isaac and the nation is born. If you add 1948 and 99, I hope I got my math right on this. It should take you to 2047. And that is when God circumcises the hearts of Israel. And he is, by that time, he is ruling in the city of Jerusalem over his kingdom. <laughs> At 2023... Three things happened, and I'm talking 2023 on our time frame, and I'm going to relate it to right now what, what God would have the body of Christ to do. Abraham began receiving promises from God about his future in Genesis chapter 12 when he was 75. That's when he got heard from God. That's when he started making the transition, and that's when the vision started appearing to him for God telling him, what his whole life would be about. Woo! So let's just say, in my opinion, 2023, because we are in the pattern of Abraham, you know that prophetically. I showed you 1948. What could be clearer than that as our starting point? The Lord is going to say to us, you've been asking me about the will of my will and my purposes. They are now about to be released. I'm talking about now. I'm talking about from here on out. <laughs> now, for those of you that's been praying for that, you need to put your hands together, give God a shout, and you need to say, I believe it, and I lay, hey, I lay claim to it. Mm. The second thing in, in chapter 12, verse 7, same age now, he began to build altars. And I remind of the Lord <laughs> that this group, many of you were not here from the start, but some of you were that this group has been praying for 12 straight years. We started off in a barn, and the only reason we stopped the barn is it got too cold and too hot up there. And my precious older people that had hips and knees replacements had a hard time climbing those steps, and I start feeling it too. <laughs> so I start praying on flat ground, aren't you? Somebody thank God for flat ground. <laughs> So what we're going to do is he started building altars. So the prayer, mark this down, you're going to see more people beginning now talk about we've got to get back to praying and not just talking it. You're going to have prayer. Did you see what happened down at Auburn University? Who saw that on the Internet? Where this lady had been having a prayer meeting with five ladies praying at this big, and they had 5,000 people showed up, and the coach of the, was it the, was it the football team coach? Was it? You sure it was? Now, you're an Auburn fan. I know, I know you're trying to build them up, but you sure it was the football coach? I think it was. But he shows up and helps baptize these hundreds. How many got baptized? Huh? Was it? Th I think it was thousands. All right. And, you know, it all started in a prayer meeting. Talk to me now. Every one of these revivals breaking out in the United States, they have a huge one at Texas A&M right now that they can't stop. It's going crazy. We had one at Lee. I don't know how, I don't, I don't know the end of that. I'm not familiar with that, but I know there was one at Lee. There was one up at uh, Asbury College. Asbury College, they had to stop it. They had no restaurants. They had no restrooms. They had no hotels. I mean, it was so big. Well, if I had been them, I would have just got me a 10,000 seat tent stuck it on a property somewhere and said, okay, carry on, come to class, get your grades, but carry on. That's what I would have done, you know. But that's up to them. But my point is they all started, even the Lee one started, in a prayer meeting. It was a bunch of kids praying, just praying, and it broke out. So here's what you're going to see 
You can mark this down. You're going to see more emphasis on we've got to pray. We've got to pray. Prayer meetings are going to break out. They're going to start calling people to prayer more because this is the pattern of Abraham. He built the altars. And then it says he went to Bethel. Well, that means no significant to you to you understand that Bethel in Hebrew means the house of God. And there must be a return to the house of God. COVID put a hope, and I don't mean this disrespectful because I do understand some of the fears that people had, especially when people are dying. I haven't heard of, I, I know that the flu killed 60,000 people a year, according to the statistics, the regular flu, but I, I don't, I've heard people have it and they're getting over it and people have had it, I've had it three, less, I've had it three or four times myself and I just keep surviving. And it, get, it gets less and less and less as it goes along. Thankfully, let's hope that's the way it is. But I'm saying I do understand when there was the peak of fear and my mother passed away with that others in this body had it passed away with it. I had two of my secretaries that passed away. So I understand that. But I also know that when things begin to pass, you got to come to the place in your life where you got to say, I'm either going to live in my house all cramped up and I'm going to go to the store at night because I don't want to be around nobody. Or you're going to say to yourself, you know what? The devil is a liar. If I'm going to go to heaven one day anyway, I'm going to go to heaven happy. I'm going to go to heaven worshiping. I'm going to go to heaven shouting. I'm going to go to a Perry Stone main event. I'm going to go to prophetic summit. I'm going to the cafe and drink coffee and eat because if I'm going to leave this world, let me leave speaking in tongues and happy the way Tommy Bates sings it. You understand what I'm saying? And so there's been people that have, and, and we've talked to some of them in town. They tell Pam, oh, you know, Pam, I haven't been back, but I sure don't miss a service on the internet. You better understand that in Genesis chapter 12, when the 75 years came, Abraham not only was building altars and praying, but Abraham was showing up at Bethel, which means the house of God. And by the way, he talked about Bethel and said, this is the house of God and this is the gate of heaven. And there are portals and churches. I know we got one on this property. I know for, I could tell you all, look, you, no, I'm not going to get into that. I'll have every weirdo in the country showing up. We've had, we've had lights showing up floating in the atmosphere I don't mean way up there I'm talking about 10 feet from people lights floating and sh sh shining around and freaking people out and angels showing up on the property and disappearing let me tell you what this is we had seven men walk in this building I don't want to tell you the story but we checked the cameras they did not show up on the camera our security guy was talking to nobody but there were seven men and they were all dressed in black they were all muscular they were all olive skin and they showed up at a warrior fest and walked in that building and down that aisle and sat over here and our security team said we just let seven men in we better check them out and we couldn't find them we couldn't find them on camera and everywhere they showed up on cameras the cameras went bzzz and went crazy and that has never happened before don't you tell me that this is not a portal house I've, I've told you from the beginning hallelujah this land was owned by people who prayed and fasted and were full of the Holy Ghost and we have a portal here and if you think the devil and every other the devil in heaven is going to run me out of the place where there's a portal. You got another thing coming. I know what God has planned. You know what God has planned. Pam knows what God has planned. Rick knows what God has planned. We have an asylum. Hallelujah. Put me under the portal. Oh, <laughs> yeah. The number 70 is two Hebrew letters, Ein, whose value is 70, and He, which is value is, whose value is five. And remember, I told you the letter He was inserted in Abraham and Sarah's name, all right? And it changed their name. <laughs> the symbol of Ein is an I, and the symbol of He, as we've told you, it's a breathing sound that represents light. Light is mentioned five times at creation because God said, he said, oh, and he breathed into man. Oh, come on, you'll get this in a minute. You think about it tonight, it'll come back to you. Here's what I believe the Lord is saying. And I want to wrap it up with this right here. Uh, you and I know, if we know scripture, that in the parables, Jesus talked about a time of separation was coming. He said there'll be wheat and tear growing together in the same field, and the angels will come and sever them. He said that there's going to be sheep and goat. He said, they'll be separated. He talked about a net with fish, and there were bad fish, and they were separated from the good fish. Abraham was in the land of Babel, the land of Ur of Chaldee. And that is the area where, or let me say close to the area, where the Tower of Babel had been destroyed by God. 
And I thought about that, and it said, he said that he told him, leave this area and start walking. And I'm going to take you into a land that's a land of, and he said this to Moses, that flows with milk and honey. Where you will have houses you didn't build, vineyards you didn't plant. Help me, somebody. There's an inheritance there, right? But he had to leave. I read in Revelation, I told Steve this the other night. I said, Steve, you realize in Revelation, he came from the area of Babel, which would later become Babylon. And in the book of Revelation, chapter 17 and 18, there's a mystery Babylon, which is a religious system. And God's word says, come out of her, my people, that you be not a partaker of her plagues. And that's when it hit me. I promise you that's when it hit me. When Abimelech tried to steal Sarah, God plagued his house. Did you know that's in the book of Genesis? When the king of Egypt tried to steal Sarah from Abraham, God also did the same thing to him. And I'm going to give you the word of the Lord, and I do not mind this being quoted. I don't mind you saying, but if you say it, please say it right. Because I have been misquoted before with things I never said, ever. So please say it right. But if you look, there's two things that happens to him. Number one, God says to him at 75, now I'm going to bless those that bless you and I'm going to curse those that curse you. We can apply that to Israel because that's the context of the setting. But I believe we're coming to a time. There have been so many people belligerent against the Holy Spirit, dishonorable toward men of God. I'm talking total dishonor, have no honor, and God's about fed up with it. God's about fed up with it. And God is about to say, you know what? If you're going to be belligerent toward my spirit, then when something comes, and there's, there's more plagues coming, there's more pestilence coming, then I will take the defense off of you. And you'll be plagued when my people are not because my people have come out of the corruption and out of the system and out of the things that, that are not from me. And they've separated themselves in my word and in my power and in, in the prayer life. And I do believe that the, the blessing, blessing and the cursing and all the curse means that doesn't mean God's going around cussing everybody out and God's going around beating people in the head. You know what it means? One of the Hebrew words means to diminish and make little. So you start out good and everything gets diminished. You start out, you start a church with a large number of people. Then there's nobody there. You, you, you buy your property and find out that there wasn't an oil well on it, that there's a septic tank under there. <laughs> it's, you, are you tracking with me? And you know why? Because you didn't do what the Lord really wanted you to do. It was about your heart. It was about you keeping your heart right. It was about keeping your spirit right. It was about keeping a prayer life. It was about forgiveness. It was about restoration. It was about purity of heart and mind and body, spirit. I can stand, let me tell you something. I can stand before you right now and look at you. And if God Almighty walked in this door and say, my conscience is clear before God and man. My conscience is clear before God and man. You know why? Because I believe with all my heart, I've tried to do everything the way the Lord wanted me to do it. Even if I was wrong, I'd repent. Not too many guys will get up and repent. But I'll repent if I'm wrong. But if you do the right thing, guess what God does? He blesses you if you do the right thing. Anybody here want to do the right thing? Yeah. All right, so... This come out of her, my people, to me represents when Abraham makes the move out of that paganic land and says, I'm moving toward the presence of God. I'm going to go to a place. And he lived at Beersheba, which had seven wells. Oh, don't make me preach on that. Seven wells. And the Philistines got mad at him and came up and took dirt and sand and threw it in the wells. And it says Isaac redug the wells in a time of famine and had a hundredfold return. And the Philistines were envious of him. All right, here's what's going to happen. Number one, there's going to be a separation of the wheat, and, and, and this happens more at the end of the age. Wheat and shares, uh, uh, profitable servants, unprofitable servants, five wise virgins, uh, five foolish virgins. And there are some things coming that God wants to truly separate his people from some of the things that are coming.